Okay, well, I'm excited here to welcome everybody here. I'm John Force, 15-time Funny Car Champ, better known as Ashley's dad. Uh, but they got some questions here they want me to um, answer. Okay, Donnie, you asked, what was my first race car? Well, it all depends how you look at that. I always wanted to race from the very first car that I ever had. The first car I ever owned was a 64 Ford Fairlane. I bought it off a used car lot for $600. I put a three-speed transmission in it, took it off the column, and later put a Ford uh, 352 Ford Interceptor motor in it, and I took it to the drag strip a couple of times. Um, actually earned a trophy with it that I still have, um, and I guess you could kind of say that was my first race car because I raced it on a, a racetrack. Then it says, what was the first car you ever drag raced? That was the first car uh, that I drag raced. Okay, it went dark again. Hit that button. Okay, but we're going we're gonna to hit you with two things here because we got to move along quick. <clears throat> In the early days, uh, I street raced, but we don't do that anymore. That was in the early days. I couldn't afford to get a ticket to get in the racetrack. But the first car I ever really drove down a drag strip that nobody knows about was a dragster, front-engine dragster. I don't remember the wheelbase. It had Howell brand wheels on it. And, and what was cool about it, it had an Oldsmobile motor with an injector on it. And um, Cerebro Magneto, it was just totally cool. And I bought it from a guy, made a couple of races in it, and blew the motor up. But that was a race car. But my first fuel motor was in a fueled Allard. That's a short wheelbase, like 92-inch wheelbase. Uh, it's like Wild Willie Borsch's fuel Allard or Pure Hell or Pure Heaven and those cars um, uh, that I raced in the early days. Cars like Nanook uh, that actually Dean Antonelli's uh, dad uh, owned some of those cars for a period of time and raced and drived them out of Tucson. Uh, but my first fuel funny car, my first fuel funny car that I can truly say was a Ford. It was a Mach 1 Ford body and I raced it. It was a rear engine. The motor was behind the driver and the motor set sideways and it was chain driven. And that was built by one of the great men in drag race in the history, Jack Chrisman, and, and also with, with his uncle Art Chrisman, but it was a rear engine sidewinder, it was called. And I actually drove it a number of times. I ran 200 miles an hour with it. Uh, or maybe, no, maybe it was 180 miles an hour. But it was quite an experience, and that's when I was back driving a truck, uh, raising a young family in the early days. Uh, with my daughter Adra, and and uh, she was baby girl back then, but it was a Ford Mustang Mach One single overhead cam motor on nitro blown. That was pretty awesome. I have photos in my museum, so if they request the pictures, we can show it to them. But nobody knows that. My first fuel funny car was a Ford. Later years, I went to GM with Oldsmobile. And then when I really started winning races, I ended up with Ford Motor Company. Okay, how am I doing so far? You're doing good. Okay, so I hope that answers it. Sorry about that, I'm gonna cut these shorter. So Donnie, that's my answer. Okay, next individual, Howard E. Snow Jr. Howard E. Snow Jr. When did you know you wanted to make drag racing your career? First of all, I always had love of sports. I always loved camaraderie and that was being with a team. I played, I, I used to hitchhike in Northern California in the snow 20 miles when I was in like fourth grade because I wanted to play Pop Warner football. As a kid I had polio and my right leg is small, it's not as strong. I had to be real aggressive. I had to work harder just to be as good or maybe close to as good as the ones I played against. So I had to be very aggressive because I couldn't run that fast. I stumbled sometimes and I, I never even realized it as a kid that I had this problem. I knew I had polio 
uh, you know, when I was one year old. But when I got to college is when my coach said, you got a problem here, right leg smaller than the left. You, you can't run right, and it, you did okay in high school, um, but it's going to be tough for you in college, and you can look at being a pro, but it ain't going to happen. It isn't going to happen. Proper English here. So what I did was, I thought, I love the cheer of the crowd. It wasn't about making money. It was a journey that I was on in life, and I really wanted to be part of something. So I said, I'm going to find a way that I can be in sports. And a race car was that opportunity for me because the race car did the running for me. And that is when I decided, and that was at a young age, just out of high school, that I was driving a truck, I was racing cars part-time on the weekend for fun, hobby racing, but then I thought, I'm never going to make it in football or baseball or, or any type of sport where you have to run, and I decided I'm going to drag race. And that race car, that Ford Mustang's been running all these years, and I was lucky along the way, I met great people, so many sponsors. In the early days, Wendy's, Coca-Cola, uh, Wiener Schnitzel, uh, uh, food chains, and, and stop-and-go markets, Jolly Rancher Candy, Naturally Castro come along, and Auto Club of Southern Cal, uh, Brand Source Matt Tool, and then Ford Motor Company, God bless them, been with me almost 15 years. Uh, so I've been real fortunate in the hot rod. So I would say in 1974, I went to Australia, I quit driving truck, I still drive the truck to this day, I still have my class one, but at the end of the day, I went to Australia because they would pay me to race because I had no money, and they, they just thought Americans were the hot stuff, even if I was terrible, they thought I was great, and it started in 1974 down under in Australia, I remember that year I saw The Exorcist, and I saw the movie Jaws, and when I got to Australia, I saw a shark big enough could swallow a Ford Fiesta, and I'm not kidding. So, that's the answer. What do you think about that, Howard? How am I doing so far? Okay. How does all this relate to that contest? I don't understand that. They're getting to ask you any questions that they want. That they oh, okay, to okay. So, I'm going to answer some more questions here. By the way, that picture behind me is my beautiful daughter, Ashley. Can you see it? That was taken by Jim Gennard, one of the greatest photographers I ever met. And it was her with her pink Rookie of the Year car. Okay. Okay. Barry E. Warren. Barry E. Warren. God, I wish I knew where these people were from. Can't they call back and give me a little information? We can so, find them on, on okay. there. They're our fans. Yeah, but I don't know how to run a, They're our fans? Yeah, they're our fans. What if they're Baysmore or, or Hagen's fans? I'm Hagen's fan. I like that kid. Okay, Barry E. Warren. Which has the most thrill? The G-Force at the start or crossing the finish line? That's a great question, Barry. The truth is, on the starting line, you have all that pressure of cutting the light to beat the other driver. When you stage it, pre-stage it, stage it, and the amber comes down, you've got to cut that light to win. So you, you don't have time to think this is fun or not. That is even in qualifying, because you're trying to get it down that alley. You're trying to get it down that thousand foot to win the race. And then when you put out the parachute, that's all exciting. You know what I'm saying? Because first of all, if you're not on fire, you know you're safe. And you've seen over the years in fuel funny cars, with all with all the technology and safety from the Ford engineers that we put into these cars and working with chassis builders like Merck McKinney, these cars are safe, but they can still hurt you. Uh, it happens in any type of sport, and we're never going to be able to change that. We can only continue to keep building better race cars and, 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 and safer technology, and we do that with NHRA and their group and also with the pro organization of all the drivers contributing. But to answer that question, if you got out of the car and they said that you won on a hole shot, if it was a legit hole shot, not where you rolled deep and it looks like you left early when really you didn't, you know what I'm saying? But if it's a legit, well, then you can look back and say that starting line was unbelievable 
because you did your job, you won for the team, you won for the fans, and you beat the other guy because maybe he outran you, he was quicker. So the starting line can be exciting. But on the other end, the finish line, that's where you get the win. And it's a combination of what took place when you get out to do that interview and they're standing there from ESPN. You're yelling and screaming. And, and at the end of the day, the win line. So it's mixed emotions. If you just win the round, you're excited. But for a driver to know that you had won because you left on the guy, that's exciting. But then you know the team and the crew chief that worked so hard to give you a great car. You know that they won. They did their job because maybe the car just outrun him. So it's a mixture of both. But great question there, Warren. Okay. On to the second page. Greg Boltima. Greg Boltima. Uh -huh. I'd like to know what, what uh, where that comes from. That's kind of unique. Yeah. You ever heard that before, Stephanie? Boltima, no. Craig Boltina, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. When do you think the Nitro class will go back to racing in the quarter mile? When do you think the Nitro class will go back to racing on a quarter mile? Well, first of all, I can't answer that. Uh, that is the sanctioning body, NHRA, and they make those decisions. I know it was changed because of things that had happened. Number one, these race cars that used to run 100 miles an hour, then 150, then 200, then 300, then 340, when the top field of funny car, <clears throat> a lot of the tracks were from the early 50s and 60s. They started on airports when Wally Parks started all this back, uh, you know, in the 50s, long time ago. But we outgrew the racetracks, so NHRA had to make a change. NHRA had to make a decision because when you got a racetrack that's got a golf course on one end and a railroad track on the other and a race car is trying to run 340 miles an hour, sometimes you can't put up enough safety nets or sand traps like NHRA did or retaining walls that no matter what you do, you need to have runoff area. I know when I'm in Dallas, Texas at, 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 at Billy Myers Motorplex, or even uh, Charlie Allen's track at Firebird, that they have, uh, you can run out into the middle of the desert or the middle of Texas. You got all the room you want, to, you know, to to shut this thing down, and and uh, and so it kind of evolved. So the answer to your question, do I think they'll go back? So many of my records are there in the early days, speed, et, things that I had accomplished on the quarter mile. But, number one, for safety, that's a hard call. They may lose some major racetracks and some major markets, and as much as they don't want to lose them, you don't want to lose a race that's, that's in your hometown because the track's too short. But number two, there's also financial cost. In, in this economy right now, the race teams, when you run that car, that extra 320 feet beyond the 1,000 foot, it costs more money. But I can tell you this, because of safety, one of the things NHRA implemented was a, a device that would slow the motor down. The whole idea was when you got to the, uh, the thousand foot, the motor was already being choked back because they were trying to slow it down. So all it was doing was beating itself up from the thousand foot to the 1320 or the quarter mile. So we weren't really accomplishing any, anything. Uh, you know, you were just coasting past 1,000. So uh, NHRA made a rule to do that. So they're addressing it. Won't say back. Uh, I don't really think so. And I'm good with that. But like I said, I don't make the rules. So let's move on for that. I leave it to the sanctioning body. Uh, they've seen it all. They've done it all. And they do their best to make the right decisions. And in the end of the day, you can't make everybody happy. Okay. Does that answer uh, Greg or Craig? Greg? I hope it does. Darren Gappa, G-A-P-P-A. -P -P -A. Darren Gappa. Have you ever ran a top fielder somewhere down the line? If so, did you like it? No, I can answer. Uh, Darren, I I've always uh, respected them as the king, king of the sport. 
But there was times years ago, uh, you know, uh, that that we even outran the dragsters in speed on top of the mountain at Denver. We were very lucky. Our, our car had great aerodynamics, and, and, and we outran them uh, with those Ford Mustangs in English Town. We were able to do that. Um, we even beat them in, in a playoff, and I'm not taking anything away from Top Fuel. They're the king of the sport. Those guys are my heroes. They're, they're kind of our big brother, you know, uh, but I love it. Uh, they're all about speed and ET. Um, the cars are lighter, uh, which allows them to run quicker. But we run the same Boss 500 motor. We run our motor, and it's got the same horsepower, the same cubic inches. So, uh, but there's a weight difference. Uh, the aerodynamics that helps us. You know, I wish I had Robert Hyde here. He explains all this stuff better than me. He's really, really a great racer driver. Uh, uh, but but a gearhead, he understands a lot of stuff that that has passed me up over the years. Is my hat straight? Okay. And, but um, at the end of the day, we even raced years ago. They had the big showdown. Uh, Bruton Smith, always an innovator, um, came up at his new racetrack in Bristol. He had the showdown, the Winston showdown, and we went against the dragsters for a quarter of a million dollars. And I beat the young kid Vandergriff in a, in a, in a pedal fest. Uh, and, and, you know, I think funny cars, as wild as they look, harder to steer and handle. I do believe in a pedal fest, uh, they really recover better. Or maybe I just had a lot of experience because I matched raced a lot in the early days. Uh, and I still do now uh, with Bill Bader out of Norwalk. And, and uh, But we were lucky. We got the beat. We got the money. And, uh, by the way, Vandergriff won his first big race. I think it was at Dallas. It was, it was happy for him and his dad. He ran all the way back up the racetrack. He was so pumped up because I know about wanting that, that, that Wally, wanting that win, because I went so many years that I couldn't. I was the perennial, perennial bridesmaid. Nine final rounds. And, I, and that was with the great Austin Coyle. That was 1988, 1989. And we went on there to win all these championships. So that's my answer. Uh, but I'm sure I will dip into that later into my career. But I'm never going to quit funny car racing because that's what I do. It's what I love. I drive a moving billboard at over 300 miles an hour, and I absolutely love it. Okay, next question. I hope that answered it, Darren. <clears throat> Beth Kane, Beth Kane, ever consider being a celebrity on Apprentice? I think you would blow the competitors away. A celebrity Apprentice, I've seen the show. I've watched it. Isn't that with Trump? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd consider going on that show. Uh, you know, they asked actually to be on Dancing with the Stars. Uh, but since my crash, I don't dance so good. I never dance good. They wanted actually, it was just impossible with her race schedule because you really have to get involved into that. Uh, Celebrity Apprentice, I've seen the stars, I've seen the shows, but I'm really a big fan of Donald Trump. Uh, not that I have money anywhere close to Donald Trump, but I think like him, I made a statement once that he was a workaholic, and I've had people say it about me, but I know that, that he made a statement once, because I don't do vacations, me personally, but they said once, has, did he ever take a vacation? He has been interviewed. He said, yes, I did. My wife got me to take a vacation to an island. And they said, did you enjoy your vacation? And his answer was, I ended up I ended up building a hotel there. Well, that's John Force, because, you know, I like to lay on a beach and have a, a, a cup of wine or a glass of wine. <clears throat> but I like to be creative. That's my vacation to create. So I'm a lot like Donald Trump, and I think I would like, uh, you have to be creative. When you look at Henry Ford, you think he just sat around and thought, I'm going to build this empire and build this great automobile. No, he went after it. He lived it. You know, uh, his family, Edsel, they live it. His son, uh, uh, Bill Ford uh, III, or, or uh, Junior. Henry. Now, Henry, I'm sorry. No, that's the other bill. But Henry that I met when I won my championship last year, and he's a great friend of, of my daughter, Courtney, and and uh, they always motivated to grow. But I see that in Ford with Mullally. 
uh, Mawali that runs it. I met him at some banquets, just a cool guy. But he's lined up the generals behind him, Fields, Farley, Zube, you, you know, the guys that, that run Ford Motor Company. It was Grandma, Grandpa, Grandpa, Tasca, that told me the Ford way and, and, and the logic. I learned so much from Grandpa Tasca. Amazing, amazing man. And, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll keep learning. Uh, if you ever get a chance, read the book by Bob Tasca Sr. You will be satisfied. So many things apply to Ford Motor Company, and 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 you can see um, why they have great quality. And and uh, here I am doing a commercial. Great quality at a great cost with great gas mileage. How am I doing there, lady from Ford? Okay, I'm getting off track here. Okay, uh, but would I am I doing that? I might get it, give it a shot because I'd like to meet Trump, and I'd like to see if he could outthink me. I ain't real smart. But I dance all the time where you can't catch up with me. Kind of like I do when I'm answering these questions. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but this is real me, and that's what you get. Okay, Terry Price the second. Terry Price the second. Any ideas of another TV series? I really miss watching you guys and the gals. Well, Terry, let me tell you. When Ashley decided, first of all, we had a great TV series. Went for two years. You can still get it on DV from John Force um, Race Station here in Yorba Linda, California, or out of Race Station in Brownsburg, Indiana. But at the end of the day, we lost Eric in 07. It turned our life upside down. Like I said, you know, of, of the loss of a child, uh, I felt the pain. But I can't even imagine what John Medlin and, and Eric's mom, Mimi, went through and John Medlin's wife what they went through over the loss of their son but I know what I went through I, I just felt like the trophies had no meaning how could we go on racing I always promised my girls these cars would never hurt them that they were better than your boyfriend better than your husband I mean my wife always said I love the race car better than I loved her that's not true but the race car was just a way of life I had to live it to win and we went on to win, you know, 15 championships, myself, 17 as a team owner. I won 10 straight. 10, that's better than the Yankees. But I had a great team around me. I, I, had, I had the kids in the early days that raced with me. Some of them still with me. Kevin McCarthy, Robert Height, you know, Dean Antonelli. Uh, but there was guys out there that made all this happen. And, and the great Austin Coyle. And with his partner, Bernie Federley. You know what I'm saying? Unbelievable, they did it. I was just along for the ride. I promoted it. I had great technology from Ford. I, I just, I had financial backing 25 years from Castrol and Auto Club. And, and uh, I know I'm not answering the question, but we had to shut the series down. We had to, a &E was really good to us. We shut it down. And a &E said, look, I said, we'll be back someday, but we gotta go fix these race cars and try to help because we thought they were perfect. And, and the Eric Medlin project was created in Indy. Took me about two years. Uh, we built uh, the three rail chassis. The first 10 prototypes was built by one of the greatest chassis builders in the country, and that's uh, Merck McKinney. In fact, he just built a new top fueler for me, three rail chassis, because I won't run anything that's not a three rail. And uh, it's it just where we went with the Ford engineers, uh, in my opinion, it's six to seven times stronger. Even though uh, NHRA changed the rules for the other chassis builders, they went to bigger pipe. Uh, the way they treated them, uh, it made them stronger. But the three rails, just what we created with Ford. And anybody has the right to buy that? Um, um, if we can never get caught up in our shops in Indy, or we, we, we just sold one to John Medlin and, and his group, the three rail. Tasca runs the three rail. Of course, John Medlin helped design it with Ford. So... That is the reason the show, and then I got hurt three months later, and, and, and broke my arms and legs, and, 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 and so the show stopped. But what, when Ashley took the year off this year, and she had Jacob John, her, her husband Danny, she opened John Force Entertainment in Yorba Linda. We have a, a 60, 70 seat movie theater here. We have a seven editing bays, and I hired a kid, a kid Brent Travers, 
for, that worked, ran our show, that, that went through A&E, and he come to work with some of his guys, and, and uh, they work with us. Of course, Josh went to college with Ashley. He's here with us. And, and, and at the end of the day, um, was this all supposed to be done within 30 minutes or an hour or what? No, we're getting, this is probably going to be oh. the last question. Okay, last question? Yeah, we got one more. Well, I'll, wait a minute, then I'll move fast. Okay. Are they shutting me off from over there? No, they're not. Okay, I'm trying to answer them right. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, uh, we just shot the new pilot. It was given to John Ferder, the guy that put it together at, at the William Morris Agency. He's not at William Morris anymore, he's somewhere else. But he loved the pilot. It's based around Courtney being taught by Ashley and Robert and Neff and myself. It'll feature Brittany in it and, and the dragster. So a lot going on there. So uh, don't give up on us yet. We're going to pitch it over the winter, and we're going to bring the show back. Next question. You shut me off? No, I was going to close. We can close with one last question that somebody sent in, and they just wanted to ask you. What about these other questions? We're Let me answer real quick. Okay. Don Delessio. What are the plans for Courtney? I'm moving Courtney into the pro ranks. Will I run a top field dragster? Sooner or later, just got to find some money. Um, I've already purchased it. It's in my shop in Indy. Uh, but, but Courtney uh, and Brittany will be driving that. Uh, whether she'll go A field or top field, we'll figure that out because the chassis can go either way. Uh, the body design and wings are a little bit different, or at least the wings are. But Courtney is definitely going out pro uh, next year. Uh, we've got a sponsor right now that we put together. Okay, next question. Kenneth Michael, what was the most memorable moment from the day you received the 2010 Full Throttle Funny Car Championship trophy? Your first win is always your greatest, Kenneth, uh, because you dream that you'll get there someday. But, but I'll be, my biggest moment was winning 15, not because nobody would ever done it or, or nobody would ever been close, but it was because I came back from that terrible crash when they said that I would never drive again, may have trouble walking. But I drove and I came back and I won 15. And that was really for the fans. And that was a highlight of, of my whole career. So I'm, I'm answering them quick. Stacy, Stacy Smith, how do you prepare yourself for the 2010 finals? What were some of the thoughts going through your mind before Sunday's race? Let me tell you, you get a good night's sleep the night before. You don't think about the race. You don't even want to know if you're trying to win a championship. You don't even want to think about the, the competitor because you got to sleep, you got to rest. And the next day, you put on your game face, and you become a tiger. You become the person that's won all the championships in the past. And that's the way John Force goes after it. Okay, Steve, sorry I'm being quick here. Laura Martin, what has been your most moment in your NHRA history? In my history... My moment, like I said, the 15th championship, but I got to be honest, uh, my highlights in, in my moments in history was watching Robert win his first race, his first championship, watching my daughter Ashley win Indy, being the first woman to ever win in the Fuel Funny Car, and she beat me. Those are moments watching Courtney, you know, win Seattle in an A-fueler, watching Brittany fight week after week, still hasn't. Got her first win, but she will. Because at the end of the day, it's the love of your children. And now I've got a grandbaby, Jacob John. I've got Autumn with Robert and Adra, uh, seven years old. I just love watching her every day. Nothing's greater than your children. Nothing's greater than your grandchildren. So to see them win, that's, that's the top of the deal. Uh, the moment in your life. Lisa Spencer, how do you like being a grandpa? Absolutely love it. And, uh, have, and it says, and have the girls that are following in your footsteps, I love it. Everybody said all I ever wanted was boys. That's not true, okay? I milked that deal long enough. The truth is, I love my girls. Wouldn't trade them for nothing. And let me tell you, they can drive a race car just like the men, but the sponsors love them. It's an untapped market with the women out there. And uh, John Force in-house has a bunch of women driving, and they're good, and Ashley's going to come back. I, don't, I can't say when, but the sponsors love them, the fans love them, and that kind of answers that. So, I'm going to get to the last question. The final question. Bree just sent this in, and she asked, what, what Ford Innovation in racing do you like the most? What Ford Innovation? Mm -hmm. Do you like in racing the most? And her name is Bree, uh -huh. coming from a woman. See the women right out there. Bree, the innovation, the technology has changed so much. And sorry I rushed on the other questions. I just wanted to finish the three sheets. But... Uh, you know, 
the things that Ford have done, the most important to me was always winning championships. So the development of the Boss 500 motor through Ford and with my program, uh, the motor program in Indy and the Ford engineers and our people, that was great because it won championships. The aerodynamics that Ford created going to the wind tunnels and the things that we did over the years to build a car that was unbeatable, you know, that is something that you're proud of. Those are things that are important because they win you championships. But the most important thing to me was the Ford engineers that gave us a better race chassis that worked with the other chassis builders, with Merck McKinney, with NHRA, with the pro organization. NHRA was a big part of this. They have to approve. They had to let us test. They even invested some money into these programs to help me test. And that is a fact. But I want to say this, it was the Ford engineers that created a better roll cage. The, the day we lost Eric, we knew there was a problem. And Eric Meadows' dad went to work, working with the military, got with the Ford engineers, and the loss of Eric Medlin and the work done by these individuals saved my life. I can say it saved my life. My car crashed at the lights at 1,000 foot. Eric was at 600 foot. His car shattered apart. He had, he had head injuries that took his life. But because we changed the roll, roll cages, we put in NASA-style head padding like they put in, in, in the space shuttle. We did stuff that at the end of the day, I walked away. Even though my arms and legs were broke, that was the next development that Ford went to the next place to build that chassis where it would protect my legs and my arms, and they've done that. It don't mean you can't get hurt. It's not a perfect world. But I know that I'm alive right now because of what Ford did to get their engineers involved. And I want to give Mark McKinney so much credit and John Medlin and the guys in my brain trust that put it all together. But I'm standing here today living proof. And that's why I'll say, Eric Medlin, I love you. You saved my life. You watch over us every day from, from the good Lord above you and him. And that's why I'm standing here today. And that's why I can never quit. I'll keep fighting until I'm broke. I'll keep building. I'll keep investing to make better equipment. I'll work with the Ford engineers, whatever it takes, till I'm broke because I owe that. I owe that to all the other racers, the young kids that are out there, the Lucases, the Bernsteins, that they don't know what's out there. I've lived it. And trust me, I'll end here by saying Vince Lombardi, the greatest coach of all time, or at least one of the greatest, always said winning's everything. And God bless him, that's a fact. But in my world, when people ask me, I say winning's not everything. It's got to come hand in hand. Winning and safety have to go together hand in hand. And we have that. Because if you've never lost a man on the playing field, you don't know what that gut ache is. It makes you just want to quit living. And you got to pull yourself out of the mud and fight your way back and do something. Made a lot of money in my career, and I'm pumping it all back into it. And I'm proud to do it in, in Eric Medlin's name. God bless you, Eric, and, and all the others that have sacrificed to help us build better race cars so we can continue doing the great sport of NHRA drag racing. Okay, enough pitching by me. I made them all. Thank you.